the first time I've ever done this. And I, I literally decided to do this like five minutes ago. So, so I'm, I'm a little bit lost right now, so maybe you guys can help me out. I think the theme really spoke to me. Partly because I spent my entire 20s lost on purpose. Uh, basically, like many, many people uh, do. I moved about every six to 14 months to a completely different city. I was also a wilderness guide. And so between kind of thrashing about in the woods and, and having no idea where my own home was, I was constantly getting lost. And I really kind of loved it. Because I think there, there was something I liked about the panic, and there was something that I liked about really needing to pay very close attention to everything that you could see in your surroundings so that, that you would really know where you were. And, and I think I really loved that. And I think there was also something I really liked about the honesty of being lost. Because when you're lost, you can't pretend that you're not. You, you can't pretend that you know where you're going when you have no idea where you're going. So, as a wilderness guide, I worked out in Utah, in southeastern Utah. And I was also a uh, night version kind of person. We didn't really use a lot of flashlights. And, and I ran trips with adults, young adults. And one night after the fire, um, I said, hey, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a walk. You know, just, just so you guys know, don't wait up. I'm, I'm going to take a walk. And one of my students said, hey, that sounds like a good idea. Do you mind if I go with you? And I said, sure, that's fine. So, so we proceeded to go for a walk. Now, in Utah, they don't really do a lot of trails because there's not a lot of vegetation, and so there's not a lot of point. And so... <laughs> So basically, we were just kind of walking up these little, I wouldn't call them canyons exactly, but little kind of slots, and then we got up onto Slick Rock. And I don't know if anybody knows much about Slick Rock, but it's kind of like moonscape. We've got, we've got like rock that just undulates. And that means it kind of curves into a cliff instead of, instead of sort of going flat into a cliff. And... And it's really clear and open and very beautiful and kind of magical because it's kind of, and, and without the flashlights, we had beautiful, starry, starry sky. So we were walking, we got up on the sl slick rock, and I said, oh, don't worry, I will navigate by the stars. <laughs> and my students said, great, that sounds fine. So we were walking and talking and walking and talking, and, and every so often I would check up at the stars, and I knew which one was the North Star and, and things like that, and I was like, we're fine. And then one time I looked up, and it was all wrong. <laughs> and I said, you know, we stopped right then. I said, oh, this is all wrong. <laughs> and we were in the middle of this moonscape. And so there was a real question about what do we do now that it's all wrong? So we tried to backtrack a little bit, and I tried to, and, and it became very clear that I couldn't just fix this. And so we looked out in the calm. There was not a building for 50 miles at least. And, and I stood there next to my student, and there really wasn't a lot to say. <laughs> because I had no idea how to fix this situation. And it was January, we had no flashlights, no water, nothing on our persons to help us get through the night. And so we just sort of stood there and admired the stars. <laughs> and then one of my other students back at camp did something that we had told him so many times not to do. When he, you go to bed, you can't just put all of the firewood on the fire and then go to sleep. And so he put all of the firewood on the fire and lit up the overhang that we were camped in. And so as we stood out there contemplating the evening that we were about to spend very uncomfortably, all of a sudden an overhang in the distance lit up like a beacon <laughs> answering our question and bringing us home 
So I think the reason why I wanted to get up here tonight to, to tell this story is, is I just finished a master's degree program and I am in one of those, I'm in one of those states in life where I'm lost again. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm really checking the stars and I'm really looking out into the world to see what is it that I know about myself and what is it that I know about the world that I live in that, um, that can teach me where the next place to go is. And as I stand here contemplating the starry sky, I'm waiting for that beacon. And that's, that's a pretty fun place to be. Yeah. <laughs> So you know your life is headed in the wrong direction when you're standing on a beach in Maine and in your right hand you have a broken cigarette butt and your left a used condom and neither of them are yours. <laughs> the used condom literally comes from some 18 year old kid from Belrica who drove up to Maine to party on the shores of the Saco River where I work as a trash collector at a campground at the age of 33. And the thing is, I have no one else to blame but myself for being here because a few months ago I quit my job as a national refugee director over a disagreement with my boss. I arrogantly believed that I'd be able to find another job easily or quickly, but instead I quickly figured out how fast your life could fall apart. <laughs> for example, a few weeks after resigning, I get a letter from the IRS that I'm being audited. <laughs> now, I immediately do what everyone else would do, which is call my accountant, because I have an accountant because I'm not very good at finances. And I write him an email, and he writes me back three letters, U-G-H, UGH. <laughs> Turns out I have a shitty accountant. <laughs> the next week, my car gets run over on the side of the road. Apparently, a woman was trying to unparallel park, and she tapped my bumper, and instead of pulling on the brake, she slammed on the accelerated and launched her SUV up over the engine of my car, <laughs> crushing the engine. <laughs> Fortunately, I wasn't inside, but the next day I was inside my rental car when a kid ran a red light and smashed into my driver's side door, sending me straight down Congress Street. <laughs> Apparently, I was shaking so bad on the side of the uh, sidewalk that when a homeless man walked by, he looked at me and offered me a cigarette. <laughs> and just when I thought things couldn't possibly get worse, the IRS bill arrived and I discovered that I couldn't afford staying in my home and I had to move back with my parents at the age of 33. So let's review. In a few short months, I lost my income, my car, my house, and when you're living with your parents, a whole lot of dignity. <laughs> my favorite singer is a man named Jeff Folkald. He sings here often. I kind of have an obsession with him, as my friends know. <laughs> and in his song, Northbound 35, he sings that grace is just a measure of a fall. Let me tell you something. There is nothing graceful about chasing snowflakes into the forest. Oh, snowflakes? These are the things we call the soiled pieces of toilet paper that girls in bikinis use to wipe their asses and then leave on the ground when they're too tired to go up to the, use the toilets at night. And I don't know, maybe they think they're going to like miraculously disappear. And the thing is, they are going to disappear because I'm going to pick them up. <laughs> As you can imagine, I start yelling at unsuspecting campers on the campground, please just pick up your shit! And some cute blonde with a ponytail and a pink tank top will walk up to me and pick up one Bud Light bottle and hand it and drop it in the trash bag I'm holding. And she'll have that, like, I'm sorry face. But the thing is, I don't think she's actually sorry about the litter. I think she feels sorry for me, a woman twice her age covered in dirt and other people's bodily fluids. And I suddenly want to say, this is not who I am. This is not who I am. And suddenly I'm transported back 10 years before when I was working in Portland, Maine, helping refugees find their first job in the United States. And I remember how people who were accountants and engineers, teachers and farmers, would look at me across my table and plea with me, please, don't refer me to McDonald's. Don't make me work as a janitor in a hotel. And how I would sit there in my perfectly pressed suit in my professional office and say, Oh, come on. It's only for a few months. It's still until you get up back on your feet. I mean, it's really not a big deal. Standing on that beach, holding a broken cigarette butt and a used condom, I realized it is a big deal. Because what I lost that summer, more than anything, more than the house and the job, 
was that I lost my opportunity to contribute my education and my training in the world. And that I started to become really afraid that if my first job on my resume read trash collector at campground rather than protection officer in a refugee camp, that maybe future employers wouldn't take me as seriously and that I would be there forever. And that's what those clients in my office were trying to tell me 10 years ago. And so I made a promise standing on that godforsaken beach that if I ever got another job in my field, I would work a little bit harder to help people who lost much more than me, including their countries, their families, years of their lives in refugee camps. I would help them get back on their feet just a little bit quicker. I was 19 years old, and my best friend Kat and I decided we're going to take a road trip. We're going to take a road trip. I call my parents on the phone, and I say, we're taking a road trip, and we're taking your car. And they're like, you're not taking a road trip. And I said, we're driving from New Jersey to the West Coast. We're doing down the coast, coming back, and it'll be fine. It'll take a month or so, and we'll be okay. And my parents said, you're not taking a road trip. We said, how about we fly out to Vancouver, and we take Greyhound buses down the coast, and then we'll fly back from LA. And they said, okay. And we said, really? And they said, yeah, go. So we said, all right, let's go. So my friend and I, we strap a backpack on, fly out to Vancouver, no plan, land in the city, and we're lost. We're like, what do we do now? How do we get down to LA? We have a flight in three weeks out of LAX. We don't know how we're getting there, but we're going to do this. So first, we try to rent a car, but we're 19, can't rent a car. <laughs> then we try to rent a U-Haul. It's really expensive to rent a U-Haul for three weeks. <laughs> really, not a good idea. So then we say, okay, we'll wander around Vancouver, go to this hostel for a night, okay, go to that hostel, okay. We finally get to a hostel that makes sense, and I'm looking at a little board, and it has all these little postings, like somebody selling a futon for $20, somebody selling this, and this little white piece of paper, it says, hold on, I say, Kat, get back in here. You gotta see this little piece of paper. It says, 1980 Volvo. $300. I say, holy, we're getting this car. We're getting this car. So we meet up with a guy. His name is Bino. We're like, hey, Bino, can we buy the car? And he said, okay. We say, we'll give you 240 That's Canadian dollars. By the way, back then it was like 170 US. That's when the US dollar was good. So we buy the car. We say, is this going to get us down to LA? We say, you're lucky if it gets you down the block. We say, we're done. Okay. So we get it. We get. We actually get it registered. We get license plates. We get insurance. Like really, we're responsible, you know, about this whole thing. We get it all done. It's all legit and everything. And we say, okay, we'll drive down to LA. Now the first thing is, it is first of all, it has three hundred thousand miles on it, and I don't drive stick shift. What the? What are we thinking? So Kat says, I'll teach you how to drive stick shift. Don't worry. We practice in the high school parking lot. You'll be okay. And I say, okay, fine. We'll do this. Okay, we got it. So this is sort of a story about all the things we find on our way down to LA. First of all, we're at the border between the US and Canada, and we find our courage to lie to the border patrol. They say, are you coming back to Canada tonight? And we say, uh, yeah, because yeah, yeah. we're not supposed to like import a car from Canada to the US. And we say, yeah, we'll come back tonight. We're just visiting from Seattle, and we're going to come back. Don't worry. And they say, OK, we're just taking your word for this. So cross the border. <laughs> Then we're in Washington State, and I find my ability to drive stick shift. We go to like a random suburb, and my friend Kat says, OK, we're going to go around this block and a block. You're going to keep practicing until you don't stall out. I'm just going to get out of the car. It's too frustrating to watch you. You're gonna, I'm going to sit in this corner, and until you can get around the block without stalling out, we're not going anywhere. So I go, and I go, I go, fine. Then we keep going south. We find the biggest Paul Bunyan in the world in Klamath, California. It was like the coolest thing. We're like, okay, another thing we found. That's awesome. I find the Pacific Ocean. Never been there. Amazing. I found my ability to drive in San Francisco. Unbelievable. I found my first hitchhiker. And we picked him up and brought him to his next destination. I found our muffler on the side of the road <laughs> in LA. <laughs> Awesome, <laughs> right? They, they didn't believe it was in LA. That was great. And then we th we're thinking, what are we going to do with this car? <laughs> what are we going to do? We can just like ditch it. Like we can't just like light it on fire. Like what are we going to do with the car? You know, like I have no idea what we're going to do. <laughs> so 
we say, well, you know, we have to get to LAX. So we drive, we go in the parking garage, we drive into long-term parking. <laughs> we take the plates off, whatever, whatever screwdriver we have. We take the registration insurance out, throw it in our back pocket, take the keys, you know. Actually, you mean we've left, no, we left the keys, <laughs> took everything else, and if we say, you know what, we're just going to leave this car in long-term parking at LAX, and the next person who's lost in LA and is trying to get to Vancouver, maybe they'll find this car. That's it. <laughs>